In this video, I'm going to describe to you how MQTT works. I'm Kutai with Industry 40.tv and I regularly publish Internet of Things videos on this channel. So if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you don't miss any of the videos. So MQTT uses a publish subscribe model of communication whereby a centralized server called a broker manages the delivery of messages to clients connected to a network. And to identify the published data, clients use hierarchical topics, which can be created on the fly, such as this one. Now let's zoom into a typical communication session between an MQTT client and server. Now, first of all, for these two to successfully connect and communicate with each other, there are certain communication technologies that need to be present and they are stacked up in layers. The first layer is what your PLC software would interact with. And this layer comprises of software libraries that know how to convert your PLC message into an MQTT packet. We'll discuss what an MQTT packet looks like shortly. Also, if this was an HTTP-based communication network, this is the layer that would be responsible for creating HTTP packets. The second layer is also another software entity that resides on your PLC. Conceptually, it is called the transport layer. Its job is to accept an MQTT packet from the application layer through what is called a port. And MQTT uses port 1883 for non-secure communication and port 3883 for secure communications. Now, when the transport layer gets the MQTT packet, it splits it into smaller packets to be individually sent over the internet. And to achieve that, the transport layer employs the TCP standard that defines how to initiate and maintain this conversation with an application layer protocol such as MQTT. The third layer is the internet layer, which is yet another software entity that resides on your device. So what happens is that when your transport layer is finished splitting your MQTT messages into packets and adding the necessary control information, it pushes the packets onto the internet layer. The internet layer then uses the rules specified by the internet protocol to attach your broker IP address and your PLC IP address on each of the packets so as to make sure they arrive where they are intended to go. And then finally, your MQTT message packets are placed on a physical medium where they are transmitted as electrical signals. Now let's back up a bit to analyze the structure of an MQTT packet. Now, unlike HTTP, which is a text-based protocol, meaning that it uses human readable text strings such as this one to represent the message elements. MQTT is a binary based protocol, meaning that its message elements are binary bytes and not text strings. So with that said, the next question is how many bytes does an MQTT packet structure use and how are they arranged? So an MQTT packet has three fields, a fixed header, variable header, and a payload. The fixed header field is present in every MQTT packet and its size is 2 bytes. The variable header and payload are not necessarily present in all packets. For example, if you are sending a message to request a connection to a broker, then you don't need a payload. Now, as you may have guessed, the size of the variable header is variable and so is that of the payload. Now, to illustrate the concept of headers and payloads, Let's imagine that our PLC intends to publish the value of temperature to the MQTT network. And that value is say 35 degrees Celsius. So 35 is our payload. But whenever we push this value to our broker, we need to provide additional information in order to inform the broker that we actually intend to publish this value, which effectively makes this message a published type of message. That additional information is what is contained in a header. Now, because with MQTT, we have multiple types of messages like connect, disconnect, publish, subscribe, etc. Our header needs to be able to represent all these different types of messages. And this is what our fixed header is responsible for. And it does that by using the first four bits of the first byte to indicate the message type. Now, because a four bit binary number produces 16 unique decimal numbers, it means that MQTT has a way of representing 16 different message types. This table shows MQTT message types, their corresponding 4-bit equivalent decimal values. 
their descriptions and whether they are present on the fixed header or not. Now, the remaining four bits are header flags used to specify the features of a message type. For example, for a publish message type, bit 0 is used to set or clear the message retention feature, which means if this bit is set to 1, the broker has to retain the published message for clients that are currently offline and push it to them whenever connection is restored. And bits 1 and 2 are used by the client to indicate the quality of service it requires. This value ranges from 0 to 2 in decimal, whereby QoS level 0 means that the broker will make its best effort to deliver the message, but it doesn't guarantee the delivery and it will not be sending any acknowledgement that the message was received. And QoS level 1 means that the broker guarantees the delivery of your message at least once and it will be sending an acknowledgement that the message was received. Lastly, QoS2, which is the highest level of service, means that your message is guaranteed to be delivered exactly once. Moving on to bit 3, now this is called the duplicate flag. If its value is set to 0, it means that this is the client's first attempt to send MQTT publish control packet. And if it is 1, it means that the client is trying to resend a previously sent message. Now, the second byte of the fixed header is used to indicate the length of the remaining bytes within the current packet, which is essentially the length of the data in the variable header plus the length of the payload. Now, here's the kicker. If you compare the two byte-sized MQTT protocol header with that of HTTP, which can go up to 250 bytes, it becomes clear why MQTT is said to be lightweight on the wire and is the preferred IoT connectivity technology for use in resource-constrained devices and low bandwidth networks. And as for the size of the payload, the actual topic string cannot be more than 65,536 bytes, while the payload of the message cannot be more than 256 megabytes which means you could technically send video files over MQTT. Now let's observe how the data transfer between MQTT client and server actually works. Now the first thing that happens is that the MQTT application starts by creating a TCP IP connection to the broker. And when the TCP IP connection is established, the client then requests an MQTT connection with the broker by sending a connect message to which the broker responds with a connection acknowledgement message and a status code. Once the client receives the acknowledgement message from the server and the status indicates that the server is ready to communicate, the client will then be able to send messages such as publish or subscribe. Now, the broker keeps that TCP connection open. It doesn't close it. But the thing is, you can't rely on the TCP layer to ensure that the connection stays open. Instead, MQTT has an application level technique to ensure that the connection is still open, which is called Keep Alive. How it works is that the MQTT client will periodically send a ping request and expect to get a ping response if the connection is still open. Keep Alive is not only to make sure the connection is still alive and working, but also to ensure that you quickly detect when the connection is gone. This allows the MQTT broker to reliably notify subscribers of an unexpected shutdown of the publisher using the last will testament. The frequency at which the Keep Alive request is sent is user-defined in the MQTT application code. Now, when it comes to security, MQTT supports optional username and password fields. But in an effort to keep the specification as simple as possible, it primarily relies on security mechanisms of the underlying layers. And the most common method is to make use of the transport layer security mechanisms already built into the TCP IP stack in combination with certificates of trust to authenticate the identity of connected endpoints. Now, a key takeaway here is that MQTT only makes a connection at the start of the session, which means that the CPU usage and communication overhead of creating a TCP and SSL connection is only paid once. Now compare that with HTTP, which needs to keep making pull requests to get the effect of a continuous connection 
with each of those requests involving the creation of the TCP connection and negotiating SSL encryption. Again, you can see why MQTT is preferred when it comes to resource-constrained IoT devices. So, in a nutshell, that's a simplified version of how MQTT works 